I thought it would be easier to follow that. Um, but I think you set us up really well, brother, for what we've been talking about and um, what we're going to finish today. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 5. And just for the next few moments, um, building on exactly what Graviel was talking about, we've been talking for the last few weeks about the marks of a disciple, a disciple of Jesus. And it's really what Jesus calls us to be, right? His children, his disciples. And so we've been, we've been talking about how a disciple is marked by a passion for Jesus, right? We've been talking about how a disciple is marked by a knowledge of the scriptures. A disciple is marked by their commitment to the local body, to the local fellowship, to a group of people, to a community like this. A disciple is marked by their heart for people that don't know Jesus yet. And then lastly, what we're going to talk about today, a disciple is marked by a commitment to legacy. And that's exactly what we saw in Graviel today, right? A legacy. Someone met him, someone cared about him, someone cared about his need, and helped him. Uh, Graviel was sharing with us last night, at dinner about um, his church and how uh, his church was started by someone who came and, and, and was trained to share the gospel and basically um, started a church, started a ministry, and then now they're trying to do the same exact thing where they're trying to multiply uh, themselves in other churches. There's a guy by the name of Vince Lombardi. Anybody ever heard of him? Okay, Vince Lombardi, famous, legendary football coach. He would open each season as the Green Bay Packers head coach by holding up a football and saying, gentlemen, this is a football, right? And one of the things that is talked about in, in, a, in a book that I was reading about him, um, one of the quotes from that is that great coaches never take the basics for granted. When we think about a legacy of disciples, Great coaches never take the basics for granted. And so as we talk about what it means to be a disciple, how to grow as a disciple, and how to um, be a disciple that makes disciples, we want to think about the basics. The basics of Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, where Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then hear this promise, Graviel mentioned it a couple of times, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. Behold, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. There's a little book, uh, it's a classic book written by Robert Coleman called The Master Plan of Evangelism. And um, one of the things that Coleman says in The Master Plan of Evangelism is this, a barren Christian is a contradiction. A tree is known by its fruit. Fruitlessness was the thing lacking in the lives of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, which made them so wretched in the sight of God. So Luke chapter 5, I want to look at verses 1 through 11 together. You ready? Okay, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him, him being Jesus, to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And when he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked, them, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And as he sat down and taught the people from the boat, and when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let your nets, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the nets, both the boats, excuse me, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, get this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. 
And when they had bought their boats, brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. When they brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. And so we see that after Jesus spoke to the crowds from a fishing boat in Luke 5, imagine that scene. Jesus is out in the water. He's sitting down in a boat, right? We might think, oh, this is some, you know, this is, this is like a, this is like a, 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 you know, a cool, a cool setting or something like that, right? Peter, he, he challenged Peter to go deeper into the water, let down the nets to catch some fish, but that's what Peter had been doing all night, right? That's what Peter had been doing all night, casting, picking up, casting, picking up, no fish to show for it. No fish to show for it. We were camping recently, and I hadn't bought worms yet. But one of the, thing, one of the things Ezra, my little nine-year-old, loves to do is to cast out a, a line on a fishing pole and then just really quickly see how fast he can reel it back in, right? Like really quick. He is never going, he has never, and for, the, for those of you that fish, know that he will never catch a fish doing that. Right? Like, it won't happen. Now, what I did yesterday was I showed him on a, I showed him a fishing tournament where that happens. Right? And so it was like they cast it out, and then you see the edit, right? The edit scene. He doesn't see that as a nine-year-old. He doesn't notice that it's an edit, and immediately they're, they're reeling it back in. So he's like, see, Daddy, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. I'm like, no, it's not, right? But he has, he has um, some artificial bait that we put on there. And again, he's never going to catch anything with that artificial bait, casting it out immediately. But he loves casting it out, right? He loves casting it out. And so sometimes if I want him to kill some time or just need him to go somewhere for a minute, right? Like, Ezra, go, ca- go, go fish, go fish, right? Because I know he's not going to catch anything, so I'm not going to have to go help. Right? And he can just cast and reel in and cast and reel in for eight or nine hours. You know? And he loves it. But Peter had been doing this all night. And don't forget, Peter is a professional. Right? Peter knows. Peter knows when the fish aren't biting. And yet Jesus, after all night, tells him to give it one more toss. This would have been a little insulting, wouldn't it? To Peter, this professional fishermen. Plus, think about Jesus. He's a carpenter, not a fisherman. Right? Peter must have thought, listen, if I've got a wobbly chair, I'll call you. Right? But don't be giving me advice about fishing. And I'm sure he he replied respectfully, but with a little irritation, Master, we've done this all night. We've worked hard all night and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. And this pause with eternal significance when Peter's heart is filled with doubt but decides to obey anyway. Peter's life is transformed because of that obedience. They catch a boatload of fish. In fact, two boatloads of fish needed reinforcements to bring it in, to bring in their catch. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell to his knees. And so Peter and his disciples in this story show us three characteristics that I believe are extremely necessary to be a disciple-making disciple. Three characteristics that are totally necessary for us to leave a legacy, for us to reproduce what God has done in us in other people. And I just want to give you these three real quickly. And the first one is awe. Everybody say awe. Awe, right? A-W-E. This worship, this sense of awe. Peter was so overwhelmed by the power of Jesus that he tells them, get away from me. Right? He's kind of, he's kind of embarrassed, and he's so overwhelmed by, by the power of God, he says, get away from me. And this strange reaction is exactly what we should experience when we're in the awe of God's greatness. Right? We should be attracted to it, but it will probably also make us want to run away. When Jesus calls people to follow him, he often begins with the overwhelming vision of terror. God called the Old Testament prophet Isaiah to be his messenger first by giving him a glimpse of his glory so much so that Isaiah cried out, Woe is me, which means let me be cursed because I'm a man of unspeakable filth and a dirty mouth, Isaiah 6. 
When Jesus called the Apostle John to prepare his church for what was ahead, he gave to John a glimpse of his glory in Revelation chapter 1. And John, who had been a friend of Jesus in his earthly life, was so overwhelmed at what he saw that he fell on his face, sure that he was going to die. Sure that he was going to die. Jesus sometimes terrifies us when he calls us because only awe compels obedience. Only when we are in utter awe of something are we compelled to obedience. Until God is big to you, you'll never have the strength to obey him. If you have an obedience problem, it begins often as an awe problem. And so as Graviel said, what has your heart today? What has your heart today? What are you in awe of today? Where does God fit in your awe this morning? Second characteristic of a disciple-making disciple is this. A commitment to multiply. A commitment to multiply. Now, we have to be really careful with this one because we've talked about this a lot here lately. And one of the things that we've declared um, with much enthusiasm by you is that the world only needs one Travis. Right? The world only needs one Travis. Right? And, and, and while I, I completely buy into that, the call of God through the Scriptures is that I've got to reproduce myself. Well, what am I reproducing in me? I'm reproducing from me to others, prayerfully, hopefully, from awe, the passion that I have for Jesus and His Word. The desire that I have for each and every one of you, your friends and your family, your co-workers, to follow Jesus with everything they've got. To, to, to live a life of obedience, a commitment to, to multiply. Jesus not only commanded Peter to follow him, but he also commanded him to go. Right? Jesus, I was reading this this past week in a, in a book that I'm, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm reading. He's, it said this, Jesus is like a spiritual tornado. He never pulls you in without also hurling you back out. He never pulls you in with also, without also hurling you back out. Right? And so there may be a place where we pause our ministry, where we pause what we're doing. But know that season is temporary. Know that season is temporary. Or older folks often fall into the trap. Um, I've, I've heard this before. Well, I've done my time. Right? I've done my time of serving. I've done my time of investing. Let me tell you something. Your time is never done. It's like being a parent, right? Some of you parents that are empty nesters will often like to tell me the encouragement, the overwhelming blessing that you're paying forward of being a parent never ends, Travis. And you say it with such joy. It's overwhelming joy, right? But a commitment to multiply. A commitment to multiply. When you're willing to obey God, God will do the impossible through you. God will do the impossible through you. He'll give you a leg when a prosthetic clinic doesn't even exist in your country. He'll give you a land that you don't deserve to be able to do something incredible for people after people after people, person after person, not only in your country, but in, but, in, but, in, but in other countries. And we see this all throughout Scripture. Habakkuk 1, I am doing a work in your life that you wouldn't even believe if I told you so, yet why do we live in such doubt as believers? See, I believe one of the reasons that we struggle with disciple-making and reproducing ourselves out there is our God is way too small. Our God is way too small. Let me tell you something. If God has done something in your life, He wants to reproduce that in somebody else's life. I know it. Yeah. Mm. This is dangerous, but I feel like I'm at the rental car place and half my car is already over the spike, so I can't back up. <laughs> God 
God help us if we, were th- if we ever believe or buy into the lie that we were the one God was waiting for. Right? Like, like okay, God, you've got me to follow you. That's it. No. Jesus came to seek and save all those who were lost. Go make disciples of all nations. I was listening to a podcast this week. The, the unreached people groups are still in like the 7,000 range. Our work as the church of Jesus Christ isn't finished. It's not finished. And so not only, not only to be a disciple of Christ do we have to live with an awe of God, but we've got to live with a commitment that he's not done that he's not done. That he's not done drawing people to himself. And then number three is this. Total surrender. The third characteristic of a disciple-making disciple is total surrender. There was a pastor that was preaching on something similar. And he says this. It's kind of a longer quote. But he said, as we get older, we need to get more flexible. And let me preface this by saying, I believe this is the story of Summit Church. We have a lot of people in this room that bought into this belief that I'm about to share with you. And so some of you may hear this for the first time, this idea. Some of you may be reminded of this and hopefully inspired and encouraged by how we've seen this over the last seven years among us. But he goes on, he says, as we need to, as we get older, we need to be more flexible. Right? He hears people saying, oh, the young families need this service? I'll go to another one and I'll watch the kids so that they can participate in that service. Oh, the parking stinks? I'll park anywhere so that folks who need the parking can be close enough to the building. That might be hitting home to some of you recently who have to walk across the street. Where where are we at? But what can happen is you reach a point where you're like, I don't like change, and I don't like noise, and I don't like order, and what you're saying is you don't like legacy. So here's what I would say. You should be willing to give up your traditions for your children and your children's children. Because at the end of the day, I've had some people come up to me and really challenge me about what I think of the music. And he says this, and I would agree with him, from my household lately, I am not allowed to have an opinion of the music. I wasn't cool when I was younger, and it's not coming anytime soon. But what I do know is this. If young people are worshiping and praising God, even if I don't understand what they're talking about, I'm really excited. If parents are bringing their children to church, even if it doesn't speak to me the way that it used to 20 years ago, I'm really, really excited. Because at the end of the day, when you become a more mature believer, you want to make space for people that are either either meeting God or growing in their new relationship with God and realize, I've already had my turn, and now you're the priority. And now you're the priority. You ever have one of those mornings where the enemy has a heyday on Sunday morning and doesn't want you to come to church? That was me this morning. I told somebody before service, I've lived a month this morning. And so I had a really foul attitude. Was really thinking about giving Graviel the whole service, which clearly probably should have done anyway. (laughs) And so I decided, okay, I just need to hear some preaching. (laughs) And sometimes... God uses the radio. Sometimes God will use a podcast or YouTube or something to just really put you in your place, doesn't he? Didn't that ever happen to anybody? So this morning, I pop on a sermon. My brother's laughing at me. Um, I popped on a sermon, and in the first five minutes of this sermon, I heard exactly what I needed to hear this morning. He said, you know, one of the stupidest things you can say when you leave church is I didn't get much out of the worship today. Or I didn't really like the worship today. And the pastor said, you know what's interesting? I didn't know we were doing it for you. (laughs) 
I didn't know we were doing it for you. See, where we have to get to to be a disciple-making disciple is not only awe, is not only a commitment to multiply, but total surrender to where we get to the place where, you know what, this isn't about me. But if there are people far from God that need to experience God and they're receiving something in this place, I'm excited. I'm really excited because God is moving in our midst. That's exciting. Right? And so here's the deal. One of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to discipleship is I don't have time. Right? Because most of our lives probably look this way. Right? I mean, if we've got a pie chart for our life, let's check this out, right? I'm working. I've got big family time, right? Because I've got to make family a priority. That's in Scripture, right? And so I've got to make family a priority. That's important. Finances, right? It takes me about 20 hours to balance my checkbook every week because somebody, just me. Okay. Um, right? School, if that's you. And, and, and we've, got our, we've got our pie for church. And so what I believe many of us try to do when it comes to a message like this or a series like this where we're like, yes, disciple making disciples, awe, right? Total surrender, this commitment to multiply is okay, pastor. What can I fit into this church piece of pie that'll make disciples? I mean, I'm serving in children's ministry. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Let me submit to you. I don't want you to add anything. I'm not asking you to add a piece of pie that says making disciples. Here's what I would challenge you with today. Is how do you include gospel conversation in your everyday life? As you're going. Right? I mean, God used this man, Graviel, tragic accident, just trying to get some sugar. Right? Loses his life. And so life gave him lemons. I believe God gave him lemons. Look at what, look at what he did. With every opportunity to sit and say, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done but instead takes an, an amputee lifestyle, prosthetic lifestyle, and includes the gospel in everything he does. Everything he does. Everything he does. Takes four or five weeks out of his life every year to come to the United States of America to leave his wife, his home, his church that he serves, to come and communicate what God is doing in his ministry. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing, right? And so all I'm challenging you to do today for a, a life of discipleship, disciple-making disciples, leaving a legacy, is how do you include gospel conversations everywhere you go this week? Everywhere you go. Well, pastor, I'm a, I'll look like a weirdo. News for you. You already are. The non-weirdos aren't here this morning. They're like mowing their grass or running a 5K or doing something. Like they're, they're doing something. You're, you've already done this today, make, made this a priority week after week. Some of you have been here since 8 a.m. this morning, setting up chairs and running through music. You're already there. You're already there. And this is the call of God in our lives. I don't believe Jesus was asking Peter to do anything extra. Hey, from now on when you fish, you're going to be fishing for men. Made it, ex made it completely applicable to his life right where he was. And so to be a disciple-making disciple is not a, is not a program we want to program it because we want to, we want to measure everything. We want to be able to see a fruit because, hey, it's true. Jesus says, you'll know a tree by its fruit. John 15, 8. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. But let me tell you something. The focus is not the fruit. The focus is the obedience. The focus is the awe. The focus is the commitment to multiply. That, I'm, that is not about my agenda, it's not about my traditions, it's about Jesus. And is He moving in our midst? 
and total surrender to him. I believe this is a picture of what it looks like to be totally surrendered to him. So this week, when you go out to dinner, ask that waiter or waitress, hey, how can I pray for you? What is the absolute worst that can happen? Nothing. You might get a water spilled on your head. But I doubt it. At the football field. In the park. In your workplace. Telling God, using your voice to tell of the work that He's doing in your life. The worship team's going to come. We're going to close with a song. But this is our challenge. To be a disciple-making disciple, I've got to have a big view of God. I live in an awe of Him. I've got to be committed to multiply. Committed that, 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 that what God has done in me, where I need grace, I want Him to do it in others. I want Him to do it in others. And then a total surrender. A total surrender. God, here's my life. God, here I am. Use me. Speak through me. Here I am. How do we include that total surrender in every, every, every area of our life? Our finances, our workplace, our church, our hobbies, family, all of it. And so today, today, I want you to think about this as we pray. What is the one area where you would say, God, I need this more than the others. God, I need to walk in awe of you. Maybe, God, I need a commitment to multiply today. I've gotten really comfortable. I've gotten really comfortable with where I'm at. Or, God, I need to surrender some things. Because, as Graviel said, God, you don't have my heart. This thing has my heart. You don't have my worship. This thing has my worship. And maybe you need to surrender that to him. Can we pray together? God, today, thank you for who you are. Thank you that this is your heart. God, that in obedience, we would know you and make you known. That in obedience, we would know, love, follow you with everything that we've got and help others do the same. And so, God, I do pray. It's not popular, but I pray that you call us to obedience just like you did Peter. Even when it's irritating. Even when we've tried it that way a hundred times. Maybe we left you out. But God, I pray that you would call us to a deeper obedience in our walk with you. God, instill awe in some of us. God, help us, give some of us a commitment to not stay the same, but to multiply. To share what you've done in and through our lives with others. And God, help us to walk and live in total surrender to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We invite you to stand and sing with us.